Hi, I'm attorney Bill Brownchick, and in this video I'd like to lay out for you the basics of the new Dodd-Frank law that went into effect on January 10th, 2014. There's a lot of rumors coming around, a lot of myths about it, a lot of panic, and what I'm here to show you is that it's not as crazy as you think, it's not the end of investing with owner financing, it's none of that. There's some basic rules we got to be aware of, and I'm going to go through them in this video. Now first, what is Dodd-Frank? Well, Dodd-Frank, it's a federal law, which means it applies to all states. That means everybody in every state has to comply with this. Now, what was the purpose of Dodd-Frank? Well, generally, Dodd-Frank was a bill, a big, long bill, that was supposed to regulate banks and make sure that banks would qualify and prove uh, if upon investigation or upon an audit that they were lending to people who had a reasonable ability to repay. So for example, a local commercial bank might have a farmer who's been banking there for 40 years and he has no provable income and he has very little uh, credit score but he manages to make his payments all the time. That's going to be the stuff that will be in jeopardy with Dodd-Frank because someone like that really can't qualify other than then their history of payments, which they can consider, uh, but there's going to be a lot of people who won't be able to get loans because of the fact that the bank cannot prove their ability to repay under certain standards laid out under Dodd-Frank. So how does this affect us as investors? Well, in a narrow way, very narrow way. Um, investors who sell properties with owner financing, and they do uh, quite a bit of them, in fact, a year, are going to be, have to comply, to comply and, and get into compliance with Dodd-Frank. So first let's start out and, and outline where it applies and where it doesn't. When you're buying with owner financing, whether it's a straight owner finance, subject to, um, a wraparound, doesn't matter what. If you're buying as an investor, it does not apply in any way, shape, or form, okay? If you're doing a lease option, either buying or selling, does not apply. It does not apply in any way, shape, or form. If you're selling to another investor with owner financing, or the person's just not going to live there as their primary residence, does not apply. The only time, and hear me carefully, the only time that Dodd-Frank applies to you as an investor is when you are selling a property to a person who's going to occupy this as their principal residence. So buying any kind of owner financing doesn't apply. Lease options are not sales, don't apply. It's only when you're selling to a buyer who's going to occupy the house as their primary residence, period. So those of you all worried about I can't buy subject to or I can't buy with owner financing, that's all myth, all myth. It only applies when you're selling and selling to someone who's going to live there as their principal residence. Now I know already you're thinking, I'll sell it to the uncle and then he'll lease it to the nephew. Those are borderline things and quite frankly I can't tell you whether you can do that or not because the regulations, and there are going to be many, that follow the law have not been really outlined clearly. So we'll see with things like that, but again I'd be uh, more likely to give you advice to stay on the straight and narrow and be conservative at first so you don't end up being the test case. Now, uh, the only time you have to comply is if you are within the categories laid out in Dodd-Frank. So for example, if you do selling your house, um, your primary residence, and you're going to take back either a note for all or part of the purchase price. So that would even include a second um, or, or, or a full owner carry with a first or a contract for deed, or land contract, all those are financing, they are sale with financing, those would all apply. However, what they did carve out is the one deal a rule, rule exception, one deal, deal a, a year rule. And that basically says that anybody who's a natural person, not a company, either a natural person, an estate, or a trust, yes, land trust would be included in that, gets one free pass a year. And so, when you're selling uh, your primary residence and you're taking back a note or, or really as a person, individual, or as a trust, you get one free pass. The only regulation in that that you have to comply with is it can't be something funky. It's got to be pretty much a 30-year fixed. You can put a balloon in there. It can't be a reverse mortgage. It can't be some funky option arm or something like that. It's got to be pretty much a straightforward 30-year. Um, you can put a balloon on that um, and you can charge a reasonable rate of interest. So it, it basically you get one free pass a year as an individual or as a trust. So now you're probably already thinking, wait a minute, if I put every property in a separate land trust, maybe then 
I can get around it. So the one free pass is for persons, that's natural persons, not corporations, estates, and trusts, which would include land trusts. So obviously an individual person can do one a year. Um, that means you can do one, your spouse can do one, if you have kids or parents you can you know, do it through their name. So effectively you can get this up to a decent number. Trusts, I don't know if separate land trusts are going to fly in this scenario, so I'd say be safe and put you as the beneficiary of the land trust or, and as trustee, um, your spouse's beneficiary, um, your uncle, your son, your parents, you know, that way you can stretch out the one rule to five, six, or seven. And in fact, your IRA is a separate person. Now, it's not a person, it's not an estate, but there's no rule that says that the trust beneficiary has to be a natural person so far. So theoretically, the, your IRA account could be the beneficiary of a land trust that does one deal, and your spouse's IRA and so forth. So before we get bent out of shape of all these rules and regulations, there are plenty of exemptions even under the one free pass rule. Okay? The next thing is the, what we call the three deal rule. Okay? I'm not going to go into the details really, really fine. You can do that in my advanced video that will follow up with this one. But I'm going to give you the basics. The basics under the three rule are, number one, that would include a person or an estate or a trust or a corporate entity. Okay? So corporate entities don't get the free pass, the one free pass, only persons or estates or trusts. So if you do, you've used up your one free pass exemption with all your friends and relatives, then you're going to go on to the next three. The next three are going to be uh, ones that, number one, can't be a funky loan again. It's got to be pretty much a straight amortization. It cannot... I repeat, cannot, under the three deal rule, no balloon, no balloon. That's the biggie. Now, if you're going to sell to someone and you want a balloon, then you might want to put that deal in that year under your free pass rule. If you want to put a balloon in every deal, well, this is going to affect you. Now, before you get carried away and say, oh my God, I have to have a balloon, I have to get paid off, there's other ways to, inf to effectively get a balloon, and here's what you can do. The law says under Dodd-Frank that you must keep the interest rate fixed for the first five years. Okay? So, interest rate has to have a five-year fix. And then after that, you can raise it. I'm not going to go into the details of you know, what you can charge and how you can raise it, but let's just say, as a practical example, you charged 5% uh, for five years, and then it went to 6%, then 7% in the, next, in the sixth and seventh year. Well, that's sort of an incentive to get the borrower to want to refinance at the five-year point. What you can also do, and there's no prohibition against this so far, is you can give an early payoff incentive. So instead of selling it for 100, you sell it for 110. And you say, if you pay me off in the first two years, I'll give you a 10% discount off the principal. If you pay me off in the next two years, I'll give you 8%. If you pay me off in the fifth year, I'll give you 5%, and so forth. So you've got a carrot and a stick on both sides to effectively get a balloon that you otherwise can't do. Okay. There's also rules about um, how to qualify people and prove that they have the ability to repay, and then there's ratios, just like Fannie and Freddie have their ratios, front end, back end. I'm not going to get into those now. You can get into those in my advanced video on this. But let's just say that you can't just take a $20,000 down payment, never check their credit, never check their income, and have no documentation. That's just not going to fly. Okay? But it's not that hard to prove that someone has the ability to repay. So for example, Let's say you rent it to them for two years, or you lease option to them for two years, and then you converted it to a sale. Well, their history of payments, if the lease payment is similar to the new payment on the owner finance, um, that's the history. That will help you prove that they have an ability to repay, for example. Okay? Now, once you get past the three rule, that's the free pass plus the three deal rule, now this is where it gets a little annoying. 
Now you have to be or use a licensed mortgage loan originator. That means you have to get licensed or use someone who's licensed to do the transaction. And this is where the documentation really gets strict on ability to repay and you're going to have to pay some licensed uh, a mortgage originator or be one yourself. And by the way, it's not that difficult to get the license. Um, it's not any harder than getting, let's say, a broker's license. So if you're going to do 20 deals a year, I recommend you just get the license and comply. Um, there are many third-party companies that will prepare the documents for you. So you don't have to know what documents to uh, give the buyer at closing. And they'll prepare them all for you. You just put them in front of their face and it's just another pile of documents. That's all it is. Documents, documents, documents. Uh, so within the free pass and the three deal a year rule, you can do pretty good. And, and again, three deals per entity doesn't say that I can't have an LLC here owned by me and then a corporation owned by my spouse and an LLC owned by my IRA. That, that three deal a year rule could effectively be 10, 12, 14, including the free passes as I described earlier. So for most investors, you're never going to get past that that, uh, that point where you're going to need a licensed uh, mortgage originator. Now here's another problem though. As you may know, the SAFE Act was passed several years ago, and that's a state-by-state -state thing. And different states have different rules. So for example, uh, California, there's a zero exemption. Technically every deal has to go through a licensed loan mortgage originator. Now, that rule, by the way, and, and in other states like Texas, you have you know three or four or five, I don't recall off the top of my head, and my state of Colorado, you get three deals a year before you have to use a licensed uh, mortgage originator. Uh, find out what your exemption is in your state and just be aware of it. So, so even though you're within the three deal rule in terms of the uh, Dodd-Frank, you still may have to be or use a licensed uh, mortgage originator even within the three deal rules. Just be aware of that. Um, now understand the primary difference between Dodd-Frank and the SAFE Act. Dodd-Frank is not a regulatory law, whereas the SAFE Act is. What do I mean by that? Well, if you get caught selling homes, owner financing in your state, and you have no exemption or you're beyond the three or four deal a year limit exemption, technically the state agency that licenses mortgage originators can tell you to stop doing it. It's regulatory, meaning they can say cease and desist or we will get a court order against you and fine you. Okay? Now, practical matter, that's not, <laughs> you're going to be under the radar most of the time, especially with different entities, different trusts. So most people um, don't even know Safe Act exists and has existed for many, year, many years. Many people have been doing it and flying under the radar, not even aware they're breaking the law. And the penalty really isn't that they're going to come and arrest you. They'll probably find out, investigate, and then give you a cease and desist, a chance to get licensed or stop doing it. So I wouldn't be that worried about the SAFE Act. The Dodd-Frank, on the other hand, this is the scary one. It's not regulatory, meaning if you uh, go beyond the three deal or year rule or you put balloons in when you're not supposed to, the federal government is not going to come knock down your door and arrest you. It's not regulatory in any way. What it is, is a private lawsuit, a private cause of action that your borrower has under the law. So for example, let's say you sold to somebody and you didn't comply with Dodd-Frank. You put a balloon in there or something like that or you didn't document their ability to repay. And they didn't pay. Now usually we're going to settle out of court, give them some cash for keys, you know. But on the, on the, on the off chance that we can't, that they default and we can't settle out of court and we go to foreclose them or we go to evict them and they have enough money to hire an attorney who knows enough about Dodd-Frank to make an intelligent argument, then they can counter-sue you and say, hey, I want all that interest back, and I want my down payment back, and I want attorney's fees and damages and all that. And that can be pretty scary, but if you think about it, really, how often is this really going to apply? Because if you do the one free pass and you comply with the three deal you rule, um, even if you don't comply with the three deal rule and you're in there and you put a balloon or something like that in there, uh, or you put an adjustable rate that's not fixed for the first five years, what happens? Well, you have a house um, and it's in an LLC and that, let's say you put one property in that LLC, that's all the LLC owns. And the LLC sells the property to the borrower and the borrower defaults a couple of years later and you go to foreclose, you can't settle at, you know, at a court, which is rare, and they actually have enough money to not pay you 
but to hire an expensive attorney, which is not going to work on contingency. They're going to work by the hour. And an attorney who's intelligent enough and versed enough in Dodd-Frank that doesn't charge you know, $400 an hour. Under that rare case, they're going to counterclaim against you, and you'd better settle because you're going to lose. Does that make sense? And even if you did lose under that rare case that this happened, who are they getting a judgment against? An LLC with one asset. So when you really think about it, how much is Dodd-Frank really going to affect your life as a real estate investor? doesn't apply when you buy. It doesn't apply when you're selling to people who are not living there. It doesn't apply to lease options. It only applies to owner financing transactions where you're going to sell to someone who's going to live there as their primary residence. And on the off chance that they default, which is probably less than 1 in 10, and on the off chance that they have enough money to hire an attorney by the hour to counterclaim against you in court, which is probably 1 in 200, you're going to have to sell or take a big penalty. So really, how much is Dodd-Frank going to affect your life as a real estate investor? Very little. Now, if your primary business is buying, fixing, and, uh, or maybe just buying and reselling properties and taking back a note all the time, then this is going to affect you. But if you do a handful of deals a year, you're going to find that you're going to be within one of the exemptions or you're going to be able to comply with a Dodd-Frank. It's not going to be that big of a deal. So I hope you feel that after all this explanation, uh, and you're probably a little confused, but the bottom line is what I'm telling you is, is very few people will be affected as an investor by Dodd-Frank. Okay? Now, on to my advanced video. Join premium membership in LegalWiz.com and you can get access to the detailed video where I lay out the specific details of how to comply under the three deal and under the three plus deal rule if you want to get into the intricacies of it. This is Bill Bronchick and I hope you've enjoyed this video explaining Dodd-Frank.